So the last talk will be on uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and I will try and talk about this. Okay. So heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, there are some key points you have to remember about this condition. The starting point is HEFPEF is a diagnosis, is, is a disease of the elderly, and it is a disease that is defined by comorbidities. Very important point to keep. So this is the cardiovascular health study. You see that these are community members. Amongst community members, the prevalence of heart failure above the age of 65 is close to 10%. But predominantly, 80% of those patients are HEFPEF, just delineating the fact that this is a disease of the elderly, okay? On average, in terms of comorbidities, an average HEFPEF patient would have at least four comorbidities. There's something called the Charleston Comorbidity Index. If you compare HEFPEF with cancer, this is right up there. On average, four comorbidities with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Why is it important? When I get into the pathophysiology of HEFPEF, you'll understand why comorbidity is an important uh, distinct um, uh, definer of HEFPEF. Sorry, this is going much fast. So in terms of cardiovascular comorbidities, the common ones in HEFPEF are coronary artery disease, hypertension, and atrial fibrillation. So much so that atrial fibrillation is so common that two-thirds of patients with HEFPEF either have AFib or develop, will develop AFib during their lifetime. So it's very important that to know this. So why did I talk about comorbidities? So the pathophysiology of HEFPEF is related to comorbidities. So look at over here. So these are your comorbidities, obesity, hypertension, diabetes. This is a model of the pathophysiology of HEFPEF. What we think happens is that this, these comorbidities create a sense of chronic inflammation, a state of chronic inflammation, resulting in the release of inflammatory mediators like IL-6, TNF, alpha, which do two things downstream. One is that they recruit inflammatory cells, which cause fibrosis via the TGF beta pathway. Also, these inflammatory markers at the level of the endothelium result in creation of reactive oxygen species, which scavenge nitric oxide. So nitric oxide pathway, the way you can think about that is in heart failure, there's a neurohormonal pathway, RAS and sympathetic act activation. This is your favorable pathway. Nitric oxide opposes the RAS and, and sympathetic activation that is so, uh, de uh, so uh, that is the pathophysiology of heart failure. So this two mechanisms downstream result in hypertrophy and fibrosis, which is the hallmark of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So a state of chronic inflammation is the pathophysiology of HEFPEF. So one thing I want you to understand that HEFPEF does not equal diastolic dysfunction. There are other things that are going on in the heart other than diastolic dysfunction. Because this is a chronic inflammatory state, this state is also occurring in the vasculature. So you will have increased vascular stiffness, and this creates a, a concept called ventricular vascular uncoupling, which I can discuss with you at a later time because it's very, very paramount in HEFPEF pathophysiology. But my point is that the vasculature is also affected. As a matter of fact, you will see a lot of HEFPEF patients that have a very high systolic blood pressure but a low diastolic blood pressure. That is actually the vascular stiffness doing that, something called isolated systolic hypertension. So other involvement, just not diastolic dysfunction. We also know that they have subtle systolic dysfunction. Whether you look at strain or other markers, their systolic reserve is reduced, so it's not just diastolic dysfunction. And then up to, depending upon the studies you look at, up to half, one-third to half patients actually have chronotropic incompetence. They are in, uh, unable to mount a heart rate when they exercise, becoming symptomatic. So heart, that is why we have now shied away from calling it diastolic dysfunction and moved to calling it heart failure with preserved ejection fraction because it is more than just diastolic dysfunction. So the prevalence of HEFPEF, very straight, whether it's in the community or as your hospital admissions that you receive for heart failure, 
it's about 50%. So this is the 50% of your heart failure burden. So that's something easy to remember. Uh, <clears throat> so that's just showing that it has gone over time, but in the current era, it's 50% of heart failure admissions are due to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. If you look at the community data, actually the survival is not much different from HEF-REF, so both have about equal survival in terms of mortality. Having said that, the only reason why people may ignore HEF-PEF is that in the clinical trial populations, the outcomes were better in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But generally speaking, even though they have a preserved EF, their, their, their mortality is almost equal. This is an algorithm for the diagnosis of HEF-PEF that you might find useful. There are many algorithms for the diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but let's go over this real quickly. So the first thing is you have to have symptoms that are consistent with heart failure. If you have symptoms that are consistent with heart failure and you do an echo, you should have an ejection fraction greater than 50%. So now you move to your next step. This is an easy one to remember, that you go to the tissue Doppler velocity because you're trying to define diastolic dysfunction. So if your E prime, which is your, it can be medial or lateral E prime, if it's less than uh, eight centimeters per second, that is considered abnormal and you go down this pathway. If you have any ev other echo evidence of elevated left ventricular filling pressures like an EE prime ratio greater than 13, you do have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. If you don't have that criteria, you're looking for other markers that can tell you that the LV filling pressures are elevated, like elevated BNP, like left atrial enlargement. If you have two of those, and then you can rule in cause heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. If, if you're going down this algorithm, but this is not panning out, the next step would be to do a right heart catheterization to invasively define the filling pressures. If your E prime is 12 centimeters per second, it's highly unlikely that you have diastolic dysfunction. You should move down the route of looking for constrictive pericarditis and other causes of the patient's dyspnea on exertion. I would like you to remember this because heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is a normal EF, but a normal EF can also be seen in constricted pericarditis. It can also be seen in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and it can also be seen in what Dr. Trachtenberg talked about, which is infiltrative cardiomyopathy. So one important thing when you guys are reviewing echoes, if you're in cardiology or not, is to look at the left ventricular wall thickness. This is a general rule to remember. When we say hypertension causes LVH, hypertension almost never causes an LVH greater than 15 millimeters. If you have a, if you're looking at an echo and your wall thickness is 17, 18 millimeters, it's almost never due to hypertension cardiomyopathy. You have to look for other things like infiltrative cardiomyopathy, and if it's asymmetric, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Does that make, so keep that in mind. So I'm gonna go over some of the treatment options in the past five minutes, so I cannot go into the details of the trials of the medications that were tested in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. However, I can give you a synopsis. So this is a, a meta-analysis of all the large trials in HEF-PEF. iPreserve was testing Erbisartan, which is angiotensin receptor blocker. Pepsi-HF was Perendopril, which is an ACE inhibitor. Charm Preserved was another ARB trial, angiotensin receptor blockers. Seniors trials looked at nabivolol, which is a beta blocker, and then the ancillary arm of the DIG trial, which looked at that. But as you can see in this meta-analysis, there is no pooled benefit of being on this. The reason is, I told you initially, that as opposed to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which is the pathophysiology, which is neurohormonal activation, the pathophysiology of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is different. It is due to a chronic inflammatory state, we think at least. So that is why these drugs haven't shown benefit in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So I'm gonna go into individually some of these. This is a meta-analysis of RAS antagonism or uh, ARBs and ACE inhibitors. No benefit on reducing heart failure hospitalization or mortality in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. TopCat trial was uh, testing a mineral, mineral catechol receptor antagonist, aldactone, or spironolactone, and looking at its outcomes um, in HEF-PEF patients. Overall, this trial was negative, but there are some notable features, because the primary outcome was cardiovascular death 
heart failure hospitalization or resuscitated cardiac arrest, that was a negative trial. But um, if you look at heart failure hospitalization specifically, then there was some benefit of spironolactone. The, the reason why that's important is because it's translated into the most recent guidelines. Just a point to remember that if this trial was just done in America and Canada, in the North America, it was a positive trial. Um, it was negative because of the enrollment in Russia and uh, just, uh, <laughs> country of Georgia. So, um, I mean, that's some of the draw. <laughs> Some of the drawbacks of, uh, you know, being multinational. Um, so the seniors uh, uh, trial, it, it's, it's a little misleading because their def definition of ejection fraction was greater or less than 35%. So they define heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HEFPEF as an EF of greater than 35%. And we all know an EF of 35 to 40% is not HEFPEF. This is HEFREF. But having said that, what they showed in seniors trial overall was that there was Actually, uh, there was improved survival versus placebo, and that effect did not matter whether your EF was less than or equal or greater than 35%. So this was suggesting that beta blockers might be helpful, but I told you the nuances of that, and then in a sub-study when they looked at an EF with a cutoff of 45%, there was no benefit. So, so that was the, um, now just more recently, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a slide, um, but uh, there, is a, there was a carvedilol trial out of Japan um, that tested HEFPEF, and that also was a negative trial. The optimized CHF study just is, was an observational study, just looked at HEFREF versus HEFPEF patients that were discharged home on beta blockers. If you were discharged home on beta blocker, there was no benefit when, in terms of survival when just saying the same thing that the seniors trial in uh, the other beta blocker trials have shown. Ivabradine is a, is a, you know, there was a shift trial and it came into the guidelines. Dr. Ju Kim just talked about that. Um, but Ivabradine and HEFPEF was tested in the Edify trial. And again, it did not show any uh, improved outcomes. So it does not apply to the HEFPEF population. I do want to show you this real quick. If you have a restrictive filling pattern in, uh, on echo in patients with HEFPEF that looks like this, all this is wasted time because there's, there's no filling occurring on, in that. So I have one minute. I, this is uh, freaking me out. But I'll, I'll do, uh, I will do two minutes above this. Okay. All right. Um, so if you see this type of a Doppler pattern, Doppler pattern on your echo in a patient that is being diagnosed with HEFPEF, most of the filling has already occurred. This is wasted time. They have a fixed stroke volume. This is a patient you have beta blocked too much. The heart rate is too slow back off on the beta blockers so that they can improve their cardio output by having a higher heart rate. Does that make sense? This is an important clinical pearl to remember when you're managing your patients with HEFPEF. Um, so sildenafil, uh, again, it, it improves, improvises on the nitric oxide pathway, which is a beneficial pathway in heart failure, was test, tested in the RELAX trial. The outcome they looked at was peak VO2, or your exercise capacity, and whether you were on sildenafil or placebo, there was no difference in exercise capacity. More recently, there was a, a New England Journal article on NEAT HEFPEF trial, which is uh, looking at nitrates in HEFPEF. This was also a completely negative trial. So much so, actually, the people who were on nitrates had less exercise capacity and were less active than the patients um, than who were uh, not on <laughs> nitrates, so negative trial. Um, statins, why am I even talking about statins? The reason why I'm talking about statins is statins has an anti-inflammatory effect, and I told you that there is a chronic inflammatory state in HEFPEF. We don't have randomized controlled trials, but observational studies have actually shown improved, sur uh, improved survival with statins, but, but no randomized controlled trials. So it, does, it is a proof of concept that um, statins may be helpful. Now. And Tresto is being tested, like in the Paradigm heart failure, is in the Paragon heart failure trial, it is being tested um, for HEFPEF patients. I can tell you the results are not out yet, but anecdotally speaking, this actually may be one medication that may be helpful in improving symptoms and, 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 and outcomes in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but the, but the result, trial results are not out yet. Um, CardioMEMS is an implantable PA sensor that is implanted in the left pulmonary artery. If you're having patients that have recurrent heart failure admissions, by 
implanting a CardioMEMS device and titrating your diuretics based on the pressures, what's going to happen is you, there, it has shown a 50% relative risk reduction in heart failure hospitalization. So one intervention that you can do that can reduce heart failure hospitalizations is implanting a CardioMEMS, especially if they're coming in for heart failure. This is a new device. I don't have time to talk about this, but I am happy to talk about it offline. I do want to mention one thing to you guys that's very important, that exercise training. If you send your patients with HEFPEF for cardiac rehab, you will improve their peak VO2. You will improve their Minnesota with living, living with heart failure uh, score. So it works. Exercise training in heart, HEFPEF works. And if you do both, that is you lose weight, and you exercise, your peak VO2 assessment actually is significantly more than what you would do if you do either alone. So weight loss and dieting are is a very important intervention you can make for your HEFPEP patients. But because it works and it's simple, Medicare does not approve it. All right, it's not indicated for HEFPEF. It is indicated for HEFREF, but not for HEFPEF. So only class one recommendations for HEFPEF is blood pressure control and diuretics if they have evidence of fluid retention. The class 2A and uh, recommendations are just if you have coronary artery disease, revascularize them. If they have AFib, rate, rate or rhythm control them. And then class 2B, I told you, because the TOPCAT trial did show tendency for reducing heart failure hospitalizations, that, that's why spironolactone is a class 2B recommendation. And then based on the RELAX trial and the need hef trial, nitrates and PD-5 inhibitors are now considered a class three recommendation. And thank you for your time and sorry for going overboard. <laughs> <laughs>